Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mickey Watkins, your host. This is Rollout Real Fire Renewable Energy. It's a pleasure to have you here today and a pleasure to have three very special guests, John O'Connor, RJ and Andrew Soper. I will first of all go in order. Andrew, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Andrew, one of the co-founders of World Mobile. Um, I'm originally from Kenya, lived in Tanzania a long time, been in, in and out of Africa my whole life and a good friend of Mickey from university. We've known each other for a very long time. Indeed, we have. Thank you very much, Andy. RJ, please, could you go ahead and introduce who you are? Hi, everybody. I'm RJ. I'm from Tanzania, currently in Zanzibar. Um, with World Mobile from the beginning as a co-founder. Uh, I'm out here doing the rollout, building the network on the ground up. That's it. The hard work, you could say. And finally, a very special guest, Mr. John O'Connor. John, would you introduce yourself as if everybody doesn't know already? Uh, too kind, Mickey. Hi, everyone. I'm John O'Connor. Um, I am the Director of African Operations at IOHK. And yeah, I'm here today to, to rep Cardano and uh, talk about some, some of the real fire developments and updates that we've got going on. Thank you very much, John. And we were meant to have Dainal on the show, but due to internet issues, I believe, uh, we're, we're not able to bring him in, but we might be able to bring him in midway. So just a brief update on World Mobile, first of all, before we go into the questions. Uh, I've just got back from Dubai with Alan, uh, a very fruitful uh, meetings that we had over there. We've recently launched the Discord, uh, which all of you are invited to join. We've recently launched the Roadmap and the Earth Node Specs, which was quite exciting for us and for the community, I believe. And um, I think that's it for the major updates. So, oh, we have some very exciting news coming tomorrow and the next day and next week as well. <laughs> Just a bit of a teaser there. So I'll jump straight into the questions, please, if you don't mind. And the first question will be, what are the re real fi applications that you plan to provide and when are they expected to launch directed to you, Mr. John O'Connor? Nice. Um, so yeah, real fire is like the word for us, or at least more particularly for me for, for the next year. Um, so the first sort of step in the real fire journey actually begins for us um, next week. So from next week, IO is actually lending uh, off our own balance sheet into Kenyan small and medium sized enterprises. Um, we're lending in uh, small denominations for working capital. So this bridge uh, between cryptocurrency liquidity and real world economic value, real world loan portfolios is something that we're going to be building over the next year. Um, and that starts, as I say, next week with a small pilot that we're running here in Kenya. We then plan to scale that from um, IO only money towards building out the connectors between our light wallet, um, which will be coming out around halfway through the year, so that anyone who holds ADA in their wallet will be able to get exposure to these real world asset classes um, and, you know, create a social good of lending into impactful places, whilst also earning, um, you know, a strong yield for themselves. So this is really the beginning of it. Um, this is sort of crypto achieving its promise of, you know, uh, providing uh, financial inclusion to those people that don't have it. So that's the first piece, which is uh, the financial side. The second piece, which is really exciting, is that we have loads of projects now actually building on us. So we have World Mobile, you know, connecting the unconnected, uh, which will also provide distribution, um, a means for people to be able to sort of connect into the real file layer. You've got new projects launching on Cardano all the time, um, which have got a real fight thesis. Uh, I think uh, Empower is actually uh, doing a raise at the moment for sustainable housing funded by crypto. And we've got, of course, our Ministry of Education project, which is using that digital identity layer, which is also important for RealFi going live this year as well. So we've got a lot of different things going on, a lot of irons in the fire. But for me, the fact that we are lending to real Kenyan businesses from next week is a really significant step forward. Yeah, it's super big. Great news. We're looking forward to, to supporting you there as much as we can. Um, but I guess the next question that's come up here um, is probably for Andy. I'd like to know if WMT it considers partnering or working with Empower on some level. 
Uh, well, we're already talking to Empower. Uh, we love those guys. We love the project. Their their mission and their the, the values are very aligned to what World Mobile is doing in terms of the impact and making something commercially stay sustainable, but also for good. Uh, noble enterprise. So, yeah, we're talking to them and we're hoping to be connecting up um, a bunch of their houses. Very good. And no, we love we love the Empower best crew. Best of luck for their token raise. Yeah, good luck, Empower crew. Um, so then the next one will be for RJ. Um, RJ, in Tanzania, 38% of the people have access to electricity, according to the World Bank 2019. How big is the need for the air nodes there, which give people not only connection, but electricity to charge their phone and their devices? So the model that we are deploying out here in Tanzania particularly has your air node connected to solar power and also solar batteries. So put that together, you find that there is always excess capacity in terms of electricity power that is available for the home user or the node operator to use to power up uh, the phones in some instances even up to uh, a tv can be powered on a decoder so not only do you get to have access to connectivity you also get to use your power maybe to watch your football i mean fulham is out there you know you gotta watch it support it fulham fulham all the way andy anything you'd like to add on to that because you are also renewable energy yeah, well, I mean, my background before I left Tanzania, uh, we did over 3,000 solar home systems for farmers. Um, in, in Tanzania, the average smallholder farmer is three and a half k's away from the shop. You know, there's very little energy access. And, you know, in even if they say there's connection in a village, it doesn't mean there's actually lines to people's houses and then they have access to that electricity. So um, our job and our mission back then was to bring light and phone charging and a little radio to the house. And we saw how impactful that is. Um, but the big thing, and that's when the Eureka moment hit, is when Mickey calls me up and says, hey, I want to bring the Internet to this level. And uh, that was my Eureka moment. I thought, wow, like if, if I had that connectivity back then, um, that project would have been a thousand times better than it was. So thanks a lot for, for that, Mickey. I remember the day. I remember the day super clearly. Both speaking to you and RJ, I said, um, "Andy, I've got this idea. Do you have anyone that has experience of rolling out Wi-Fi mesh networks?" And he said, "Well, actually, my friend RJ has rolled up for uh, USAD and Microsoft and others, and it, that was the rest is history, really." But yeah, very exciting day for us as a company. Good well fun. done, lads. Okay, so good memory that one. A good memory, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Special things. Um, so this is a question for you, actually, RJ. I have concerns over the security of on the ground assets in Africa. My hesitation in investing into anything in Africa is due to my perceived corruption within the governments and civil unrest. What's the African warlord situation? Admittedly, my perception may be outdated and tainted by TV and movie. And I haven't kept up with African affairs, but would appreciate commentary and statistics that may allay my fears. All right. So I, I think the, the first way to answer this question is to reduce the amount of TV and movies that you watch. I mean, we all know that it's just movies, right? It's trying, it's it's fiction, it's production, right? It's it's entertainment value. Um, so the African warlord perception, I think, is primarily something that doesn't really necessarily uh, ring a bell to my part of the world. I'm from Tanzania. We've not had a warlord. So we don't know what a warlord literally looks like. But Africa is a collection of over 50 plus countries. Um, each one its own identity, its own civilization, cultures, and its economics and political situations that are unique to them. So generalizing the whole Africa as one big bubble uh, is, again, a movie TV kind of thing. But I would say best thing to do is lay off the movies, jump on a plane, come out to Africa, start with Zanzibar. It's a good place to begin your your journey into understanding the realities on the ground and let's allay these fears of uh, the perceived loss of assets and anything on the ground. Uh, another thing you got to understand is our model is based on a shared economy. With the shared economy, so the node operator basically becomes an owner of the node. Once you're an owner of a node that earns you revenue, automatically you protect it. Uh, this has happened with things like uh, satellite television, uh, things like 
uh, TVs, normal TV antennas. Nobody would go after picking this stuff off your premises because it's being protected. So this is a similar scenario. There is nothing to fear. Uh, the risks are as other business risks sit, and that's just about it. Can I, I add something odd to that? Yes, please. We could, uh... So, you know, I think over the last 20 years, on average, um, the number of coups that you see a year in Africa has been um, two a year. So, you know, if, if you think about that in the context of, you know, 52 countries, 52, 50 contract countries, two a year isn't actually a, a very large amount. And then when you think about the fact that the vast majority of these these coups actually all seem to happen in the same countries. So I think, uh, you know, Sudan's had probably 17 coup attempts. Uh, so you do have a, a set of countries where this kind of thing happens quite a lot. But for the vast majority of the continent, this isn't a normal day to day reality. Um, so, yeah, it happens probably more than we'd like, um, but it's uh, it's not necessarily as common or as big problem as you might think. I 100% I agree with that. I've been working in the continent for, for nearly 15 years uh, in telecoms. When something is valuable to people, it's very rare that they'll they'll give it up so easily. And actually, this is not just valuable to the node operators, the people in the villages, the end nodes that give light, the end nodes that give power, the end nodes that give connectivity, they're very happy with that. There's also mechanisms in place to make sure that if you know, equipment is misappropriated, um, it won't work for the people that have misappropriated it. And the devices themselves, in terms of resale value, um, are very little in, in, in most cases. All right, yeah. this is the next question. Um, we'll direct this one to Andy and RJ. What kind of financing and support options are available for locals that wish to set up air nodes, microfinancing, training, etc.? And what barriers to entry have you identified and how do you plan to knock them down? Um, do you want me to start on the financing, RJ? Yeah, so um, at the moment, so World Mobile, we, we've done our TGE and, and we're kickstarting the sharing economy. So we're financing the air nodes at the moment, but we're working really hard and we're making a lot of progress to set up the, the processes and the structures for air node operators to buy themselves. Um, and we're going to incorporate that in the network very soon. And once that happens, that's when microfinancing opportunities come in. And as World Mobile, we'll be, we'll be supporting the installation, the rollout, and the service of these, uh, this equipment. It's not like we're expecting these guys to buy batteries and solar panels and access points off the shelves, no. Um, there will be approved vendors, there will be approved um, solutions, and World Mobile will provide the backhaul. Once those sites have been identified um, through our own you know, market access and village access um, processes. That's when we'll we'll offer these these services through other vendors. So it won't be us financing; it'll be microfinance institutions and our collaboration partners offering those services. So yeah, it's in the roadmap. It's happening soon. And um, well, Ajay, what about the barriers to entry that we've identified on the ground? So I think Andy has touched on a very uh, critical element in terms of the barriers to entry. And we have identified having a shared economy platform where, as Andy stated, that we are initially installing the nodes uh, in the communities. And we, by doing that, we completely break off this barrier to entry. And also we found a very able and capable partner. So we have an agreement with the Ministry of Education in Zanzibar, whereby we provide uh, connectivity at schools and uh, education hubs that the ministry has built. And these hubs basically become almost like your base stations and hubs where the connectivity is. So with that, that means we break up uh, this barrier of spreading the network fast uh, and, and also getting down to the communities. The schools in turn, because of the shared economy, earn a piece of the revenue, a percentage of the gross that goes through the nodes. And with that, in turn, they get to invest it themselves within the school. Uh, sometimes this may, might mean buying more books. Sometimes this might mean buying a school bus. Sometimes this might mean renovating the school. It's up to the school to make those decisions. And any little change that gets them off, depending on government subsidy, is a step in the positive direction. 
Uh, at the same time, these hubs that we've created, they basically become centers where the community can come in to get connectivity. The community it can be used as after hours learning centers for adults and those that are not in formal education processes. So there's all sorts of mechanism for the schools to earn and also to provide and assist the community that surrounds them. So this is our uh, our basic trick into breaking these barriers of entry. And it's working. It's, it's and so work. far, so far, so good. Um, here's another question about AirNotes. Uh, I guess I will push this towards you guys as well, because I'm the host and I can't answer all the questions. What is the expected ROI for locals that will deploy AirNotes? So, um, so what we've done is we've modelled the business on a. Imagine a village with about 300 people users. So obviously, the the village size will be a little bit bigger in in reality. Um, but that's pretty typical for uh, for a rural area. Um, so we uh, we've seen through all of our proof of concepts and the sites we're rolling out so far that very early days um, a, a revenue of two dollars per month is very achievable just on data, and we can increase that ARPU to at least three dollars fifty with several layers of financial um, services etc. Which we will take a, a commission for for that going through our network. Um, so we take an average of three dollars fifty. We're, we're assuming a commission for the air node of around twenty percent. That might that might change as we develop our business model. But if you do the simple maths, that that's a two year payback. Three hundred users, three dollars fifty a month, twenty percent commission. So that's a and that includes all of your solar, all of your batteries, your access point, your backhaul, um, everything. So it's it's a decent return on investment. And, and, and those and those batteries are designed to last ten years. So it's a it's a decent long lifespan as well. And it's it should also, also be said that whilst we sorry, RJ, just to jump in, I can't help myself, obviously. Um, just to be said that once the once the cost of the backhaul um, has been paid, um, then the network starts to earn more, so that each one of those air nodes becomes uh, higher revenue. So this can be exponential uh, because you're not going to need to cover the cost consistently after you've deployed the the balloons. Go ahead, RJ. Yeah. That is true. Um, another point to also n uh, notice in terms of the, the rate of return is basically in the first six months, the, the six months to a year, you probably ROI would be the two years as Andy was talking about. But for the for the node operators that would come in six months from now, nine months from now, there's a very big possibility the ROI will drop will drop in terms of time, the payback time. This could drop to literally even six months to less, you know, or even less, because there'll be more services loaded up into the system. The platform will be fully functional. And with that functionality, that means there's more transactions that are happening. That's one. Two, we've also noticed with the pilots and the proof of concept that we've done that the early adoption is literally very slow. But once the people get going, they're, they're really heavy consumers and users of data. So the rate of return, as Mickey rightfully said, is an exponential number and it will get less and less as the years progress for the node operators. Yeah, and, and thankfully, um, and due to teleprism, I mean, John Digital ID, internet without identity is not as useful as internet with identity. So we're working with the government and with IO, IO um, to integrate a teleprism to allow absolute maximum opportunity for any user using the network to benefit from value added services of financial financial services as an example. Exciting. Um, OK. What sets World Mobile apart from the local competition? RJ. Well, apart from that, we're so cool and love each other so much. Um, well, I would say World Mobile is this mashup of what a traditional ISP is supposed to be and what the MNO of the future would be. So basically, we have a combination of technologies that have been brought together that will deliver comprehensive, affordable connectivity for the end user. And this sets us separately from most providers on the ground is that we are more focused and more functional than a traditional ISP and we're more flexible than your current MNOs. So MNOs and us are like siblings. We are the younger siblings and the older siblings, but only time will tell because we do we all grow up eventually. And when we do grow up, we'll see how the battle goes out. But for now, we're the younger siblings and we are here to provide a service to the community 
the MNOs are our partners one way or the other. But at the end of the day, it's about providing service to the community and we thrive on getting solutions to the community that are affordable and are scalable and they'll work for them. That's what separates us mainly from our competition. We have none, literally. We can go where they can't go using our aerial assets, using the on the ground infrastructure, the combination of the two having a hybrid of an MNO and an ISP, the MNO coming from the sky, um, covering yeah. huge amounts of, of area, being able to deploy anywhere um, from, from aerostats and then the mesh network on the ground taking the heavy capacity for YouTube downloading and huge file transfers. That combination hasn't ever been seen before. It's not a one fit all solution and that's our dynamic network. That's what it is, the, the world mobile network. Um, Andy, John, it's an open floor. Um, what do you think makes World Mobile different than the competitors in the space? Um, you know, on my side, you know, World Mobile really stands out for a, a couple of reasons. Um, but the most important is actually price and cost. Ultimately, we're talking about markets where people are very price sensitive. Uh, you know, people will basically shift from uh, one deodorant to another deodorant because, you know, the second one's, you know, 1% 1 cheaper. So people move for small benefits. And then you've got, well, mobile coming in and saying, actually, we don't just want to offer you 1% cheaper. You're trying to come in at like 50% or, or greater. And that's just a, a complete game changer for the markets that we're talking about. So that, that's the first thing. The second part is how you guys have really intelligently integrated all of these new pieces of technology. So be it the balloons, be it the Wi-Fi mesh networks or, you know, the blockchain based identities. I think this all ties together into a very future proof package. So as innovations come along in Hydra or, you know, the speed of transactions or the cost of transactions or whether microfinance companies can now plug and sit into this ecosystem, all of this kind of change, I think, well, mobile is sort of ready for. Uh, so, yeah, as as technological improvements happen, I feel like well, mobile will, will evolve to, to, to benefit from all of that. So that's it for me. It's price and the future proof uh, nature of uh, the business. Well, make my life easy, John. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I can just add it's an it's an irresistible product. So, for me, what what I really am passionate about is we're bringing this Wi-Fi connectivity to places that don't have it yet, and we're we're trying to achieve a couple of really key fundamental things. It's one, it's got to be a big enough mesh to be convenient. Um, where other connectivity layers operate. So, for example, where 3 or 4G are, we, we have to have a convenient amount of mesh so that 95% of the time they always have access to it. We have to have a really good user experience. So when you're hopping from access point to access point, it should be smooth. You shouldn't have a call drop and it should be easy. And, you know, topping up money or mobile money transfer or all of those amazing value added services also have to be accessible and easy. So that's what we're going. That's what we've been working on, and that's what we're going to deliver. Um, and yeah, the last thing is we we're not dependent on SIM card users. So we welcome everybody onto our network. If you've got another MNO SIM card, what, you're welcome. Come to our come to our network, download the app, and you've got access. Keep your SIM card. Brilliant. You know, it's more the merrier for us. So it's this abundance mentality. We've spoken about it before. You know, we we're not limiting ourselves to to certain minds frames or mindsets and and trying to lock in people we we just want to welcome everybody and it's all about connectivity yeah the, i agree the, having the the aerostats just makes us so flexible to act as a neutral host for other mobile network operators um and it allows us to have that whole vision the way the telecommunication system works is everything connects to the whatever tower it can now when you've got this visibility in the sky we have all the handsets in zanzibar connecting to to, to our tower, tower in the sky the aerostat and then we can see where the heavy capacity is and we can actually build this dynamic network to, to say, OK, we need 25 stations in or base stations, air nodes in, in, in Stonetown. Uh, but we only need one air node over here. But we, we can then point the, point the, the radios to a certain beam um, over to Pemba and, and allow people to connect to Pemba rather than using the capacity on the aerostat. Um, it's, it's very unique in this way. Nobody's actually done it before, although aerostats have been used for a long time. Uh, this leads me on to my next question, which is probably for you, RJ. How are people going to feel about seeing balloons in the air, these aerostats? So I've, this is a question I think I've been asked a, a couple of times, even 
by other people trying to figure out how this would feel. I, I say, uh, imagine yourselves when you're watching movies. I mean, I'll go back to the movies, right? Because that's a good analogy. Um, Independence Day, big spaceship comes up in the sky. Everybody looks up and marvels at it. You know what I mean? It's a marvelous thing to see. Um, us as humans, we love to see big things in the sky. We always look up in the sky and wish for good stuff. And this is going to be one of those things. So you look up in the sky and this big world mobile aerostat up there that provides connectivity. It's going to be like a godsend. It could even be our Statue of Liberty for Zanzibar. Who knows? You know, this is going to be an interesting thing. I think the public are going to enjoy it. But what you have to understand is it's not going to be above the skyscrapers or the houses in, in the city. This is going to be somewhere in the open fields uh, where, where, you know, it can spread its its access across the whole island. So those that do cross its path will have a marvel to look at. And uh, I, I think it's going to be better received than having steel towers parked next door to your, your your kid's playground kind of scenario, you know? So I don't think this is going to be an issue. I think it's going to be a great thing. Um, Andy, what do you think? I agree. I, I think these things are going to rock and um, where we're putting it. So obviously our partner, Ministry of Education, we've identified a couple of really, really smart sites um we think we we've got one lined up and yeah i, I just think it's going to rock big time uh, yeah are, are we going to name the first one john o'connor this is the question every issue needs a name jock yeah i think if you did that charles would be jealous <laughs> okay john o'connor and ch done um the hops. right we're talking about the sky let's talk about space the community are asking many of the questions were seeing references to SpaceX tweets, SpaceX tweets. Can you disclose any more information about the secret meeting at the satellite convention that you were in in Paris in December? Andy. Um, we, we're not allowed to disclose the meetings, but it's probably nothing. So there we go. Probably nothing. All right. I like that. Um, but we are working with lots of lots of providers and we, you know, we, we always have multiple vendors for any technology and we, we market map everything properly, but we will choose the best and we think we know who they are. <laughs> Andy, was this was this the meeting you were telling me about? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Don't share with Andy. Interesting meeting. A very interesting meeting. There'll be there'll be more it's, news out very 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 soon. There's been things, lots of meetings. To be fair, it wasn't just one secret meeting. But anyway, <laughs> several, a secret secret several series, a secret series of meetings. The best yeah. kind of series. Fantastic. Okay, um, a good question. Uh, hard to answer. John, can you explain what real fight is, please, for those that don't understand the concept? Yeah, let me let me take a stab at this. So when we think of DeFi, so you guys probably have all heard about DeFi. DeFi is Lego blocks for value in crypto. So I sort of take this Lego block, then I take that little block, and then I stick it all together, and I end up with a financial product. Um, so you know, this is cool, and it's a massive innovation. The challenge is, is that all of the stuff going on in DeFi is really just about crypto tokens. So I borrow against my crypto holdings in order to go and invest in some new crypto projects. And then from there, that gives me a yield, which I use to invest in other crypto projects. So super cool, but very much all focused in market. RealFi is about trying to unlock the value of crypto liquidity to put it to real world uh, goods. So this means that I can borrow from my crypto portfolio and actually lend in towards, as I say, a Kenyan SME um, or like a real world economic benefit. So this is important because the size and scope and scale of this real world finance is orders of magnitude bigger than the DeFi side. So it's a bigger opportunity. It performs a social good. Um, and it's something that we're really pioneering at IOHK and at Cardano. So that's it. It's connecting real world economic value um, to cryptocurrency liquidity and innovations. That That's real fine. And that is why we love IO and that's why we, we work with IO and we're partners with IO because you are seeing it. This is not just DeFi, this is real fight. Very, very exciting moments for all of us. And, you know, we connect the unconnected, you bank the unbanked and it's a winning combination. Um, why is digital ID important for real fight, John? 
So, you know, the crypto innovation is making it easier and faster and cheaper to move capital around the world, right? I can send to a wallet address and that that movement sort of sorted now. That's the innovation of, of blockchain. But how do I know that the person on the other side of this is the kind of person I want to lend to? So even as we solve the efficiency side on the transfer, we still need to evaluate whether or not this is a good borrower or not. To do that, we need uh, a secure, uh, a cheap and an effective form of transmitting that information. And this is what the basis of the identity, digital identity is. It enables you to build up profiles, information about yourself, you have the ability to choose that or share that as you're comfortable with. And this is really enabling finance. These are, these are all the tools that you need in order to be able to evaluate and make a loan. So that's it. We're making the world smaller um, and enabling you know, people to have more opportunities um, based on being able to, to participate now in this global network of capital rather than um, what they had before, which is typically a small localized market. Okay, and that leads me, thank you very much, that leads me into the next, the next question, really. Um, at which stage, now that the rollout's happening uh, with World Mobile, at what stage will IOHK work with WM to provide digital identity to people that will be so impor important for them to build businesses, work, make money and borrow? So, you know, we're learning as we go. Um, I think a lot of this stuff is really new. Um, in order to sort of get where World Mobile, where World Mobile wants to be, um, we're doing a series of pilots with microfinance companies across uh, across the continent, so that we can really learn um, how we can best use our technology for these use cases. Um, so you can imagine, digital identity doesn't just have to be about a person; it could actually be about the business. So how do we get the right information about the sales of the business, about their you know their sort of accounting? Um, their accounting details, all to be appended to this digital identity. What's the best way to do that? How can I then share that with an investor? So all of these things, which are quite simple in principle, um, in, in, in reality, they're quite, quite challenging to implement. So these are the lessons we're learning at the moment. And as I say, we're lending into Kenyan SME starting from next week. So we're going to learn a lot, and World Mobile can benefit from all of that learning. And we're going to be ready for mainnet to roll out with digital IDs for every single user on the network. Absolutely. Amazing. Um, is there a plan to pilot the project in secluded villages in South Africa? And how can one take part in it? This is a question that's been asked. RJ. Um, so the plan for World Mobile is to connect and connect it worldwide. Uh, we're starting in Zanzibar, then off to Kenya, Tanzania, mainland as well. We're looking very close to also having our operations in Nigeria up and running uh, quickly as well. So, yeah, um, I would say, so why not? Uh, why not just South Africa? We've got options in Mozambique, we've got options in Botswana, we've got options in Jamaica. You know what I mean? It's not just about South Africa, but yeah, just keep an eye out. Uh, you never know, we could be there sooner than you think. Andy, what do you think? Soon? I 100% agree, but you know I'm the process guy, so for me it's strict, strict, strict. Focus on Zanzibar, Kenya, and like you say, we're starting in Nigeria right now, so we have to create those processes for scale so that we don't go back in six months or a year's time and having to start fixing things. So we, we want to get everything right first time, and then it's not a case of, oh, let's go out to two more countries or three more countries. We can We can smash out 20 countries all at the same time. Which is why Zanzibar is so so very important. I mean, we we could bring on million or two million customers onto the network now, uh, almost almost overnight. But if we don't get the sharing economy right and we don't do it properly, then as Andy said, we'd have to go back and and fix things later. So Zanzibar is the place where we get it right. Zanzibar is the place where everybody can see. Zanzibar becomes the flagship, and from there, it's Tanzania, Kenya, Nigeria, and we did have eighteen countries on our list, and it now looks like we're heading up towards you know, 24, 25 countries that we have invites into. So um, right. we're, we're very privileged at, at this moment to be able to to have this kind of attention at World Mobile. Right. But slow, well, steady wins the race. I'll th I'll throw this out for your community, but um, you know, on in three countries on a presidential level, I've been asked whether we can uh, get World Mobile to hurry up and to go and uh, start providing internet in these countries. So this is like a huge policy point. Everyone, every government, every politician, every leader wants cheaper, better internet for their country. 
Um, so I think you know one mobile is right on message on, on this on this point. So yeah, guys, hurry up! Why aren't you in all these countries? We're hurrying. Right? We're hurrying. Yeah. It's, the, it's, <laughs> it's the the tortoise and the hare, right? We need to make sure we yeah. do it properly. Slow and steady. Uh, bro, the it's, the hockey, it's called the hockey stick. You know, once you get to the bottom, there's only one way. Okay, so on to the next questions. Um, Zanzibar. So is Steve working in marketing on the grounds in Zanzibar to let everyone know? about at world mobile team yes steve our new cmo is working with dickin on a massive campaign that's going to be on the ground in zanzibar for both b2b and b2c users so they'll be advertising there for anode operators uh, as well as for consumers to join the network and this will be a historic campaign it's something we're going to put our maximum effort to and we should feel it over on this side of the border as well the ripple effect so yep steve is working on that up at five o'clock every single morning uh, bed bed pretty early, but smashing it out with the rest of the team. He is a beast. He is. That he is. That he is. And for anybody that doesn't know, Steve was pre uh, previously the head of mass marketing at Vodacom, uh, Vodafone, excuse me. So he, he recently joined World Mobile and is bringing all of his expertise to to World Mobile, and we're very happy with him. Yeah. Is this um, the, the, the poacher turned gamekeeper. You pulled him from. He he from the he big knows. Band &Os. He, he knows, he knows that uh, World Mobile is coming for Vodafone's lunch, so, um, yeah. Okay. Andy, how is renewable energy being incorporated into the World Mobile network, please? Yeah, I mean, very simply, we, we are trying to, to implement it everywhere we can at every site. So, the first thing we have to consider is uh, batteries for backup and clean power are essential for all the sites. Um, wherever there is space and sun, for solar panels, we're going to be incorporating those into the network as well. Um, so obviously in Zanzibar, Tanzania is is brilliant, um, but we have some applications where we're doing a town center and a metro mesh, um, and we're, do, we're putting some batteries and access points on electricity poles. And so that though in those instances, solar panels are not usable, um, but there are other opportunities to to kind of you know offset our load off peak times to help the utility reduce their um, their peak loads, which is when they run generators and stuff like that. So we're, we're just trying everything we can to be as, as green a greener network as, as we possibly can. And like we've, been, we've said many times before, we're using second life batteries within the, our battery options um, and just trying to be as progressive as we can and reduce our carbon footprint. Fantastic. Um, if I look baffled, I slightly am with this next question, um, but I would definitely ask it. So. Connecting the unconnected will destroy their substance in living societies and replace it with dependence on industrialization to what end? To produce things they don't need, they never signed up for, and for others who detest them. What is the motive? Whew. Um, freedom of expression, which you wouldn't have been able to do had you not had the internet to be able to send that across to us on Twitter, I guess is one of the motives. Um, the other motive is from, for us is connectivity. Um, leads to great opportunities, but we're not there to control the good and the bad. We're there to provide a connection and to make it as safe as possible for the people using it. But for us and for me, certainly, um, internet is a human right. And co what comes with it, um, including spam, is part of the process. The way that we've built World mobile, mobile Network actually is a far more private network than any other MNO on the planet. Um, a self data governed network where you control your own data, where you can see your own data, and where only you and the regulator have access to that data. We don't see anything. Um, but I, I don't know, how about you guys? Uh, what do you feel about providing people internet and the, the good and the bad it will bring? Oh uh, yeah, I've got an opinion. You know, I think this question slightly, slightly comes from the perspective that, you know, there's like a nobility to poverty, right? That you've got these like villagers running around, living natural lives that are beautiful in their simplicity. There's nothing beautiful about poverty. Um, these lives are not beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I've been down to the, the southern tribes in the Omo Valley in Ethiopia, and it's it's not nice. You know, you've got a very large percentages of FGM. You've got very small amounts of education happening. Uh, children aren't going to school. Um, this 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 couldn't 
this can be changed basically and it starts with education and it starts with information and it starts with companies like well mobile trying to um, reduce the cost of, of this internet penetration so of course you know internet doesn't solve anything it may not even solve the majority but it's definitely a start and it levels the playing field it means that people can go and do their own research and make their own decisions about whether or not the way the village their lives are happening is the right way so you're giving people the tools at least to be able to explore doing things differently and i think that's about the most you can ask from a private company but yeah just to say the game poverty is not nice there is no nobility in it um development's good rj i think um yeah i think when they when this person was asking about all this of creating this dependence on industrialization and having like an interference into the people's way of life by providing them with connectivity they missed the whole point from my perspective i think from my perspective is the rest of the world is missing out on all this creativity all these stories all these ways of living life in a different way allowing the unconnected to be connected gives the opportunity for the world to get to see hear and live the story of these unconnected people from their own voice uh, you again, you avoid the movies, and this time the movie is being made in this village. You know, the villagers making the movie themselves, they're selling their own story. So, there is a lot more content that will be coming out of these unconnected areas to the world than the content that's from the world coming into them. So, it's an exchange. The con connectivity allows traffic to move both ways. Uh, the tendency to believe it only comes in one way is misguided. Uh, connectivity works both ways. But if it wasn't the case, then most of the social media platforms won't be working. They're based on content created by the end user. Uh, that is how we see this. So stories and development that is happening outside of these areas will be picked up from these areas. And I think it's going to be a brilliant thing. It's not going to be a bad thing. It's going to be a brilliant thing. And we have proved it with the POCs, whereby we had instances uh, during the, the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns were happening, and you had students being able to learn and keep up with their studies just because they had connectivity so this changes people's lives and it has changed people's lives so the negative the negatives eh, there will be negatives in everything but there's a lot more positives that come out of it yeah thank you very much and just to for everybody that's asking um these questions are coming from twitter that have been asked but for us to answer so some are uncomfortable to answer but some we we feel that we should address and we try to address everything in the time given um as of reading this question mickey roughly how many users have world mobile connected to the internet rj so currently we have a couple of thousand users uh, surfing the net here in Zanzibar and thousands more about to go up live very soon. Um, so you will get the numbers. Information is going to be shared once everything is put in order, the systems are in place and, and all that comes into place. But users are being connected. We're currently learn running a few simulation tests and things on the equipment and what it can do. But we hope to have something substantial coming out soon. I think it's one of those teasers that we're going to be having as well of, of the users and how many they are and what the users get to see and experience and how the app works and, and, and all this stuff. So I'm, I'm sure the marketing team, Steve and his guys, are probably cracking their heads on how to present this all out to the public, to the community to, to get to understand and see it. So it's much more complicated just answering like we have oh, X number of thousand people on the, on, on the platform now. It's X number of thousand people on the platform enjoying what? What are they actually participating in? What experience are they having? And hopefully we'll have some feedback from them as well. So patiently waiting. Yeah, March is going to be explosive. That's, we can say that for sure. Um, OK. It's just going to go crazy, guys. I mean, Zanzibar is one area, but what we have lined up in Kenya once our, our license is finalized, it's, it's going to blow everyone away. It's not even going to be funny. It is going to be funny. It's going to. <laughs> Probably not funny. Um, okay. World Mobile Team. How can you make such an experienced team in all layers of World Mobile from all over the world? Can you bring them together for a good cup of coffee? Probably nothing. Andy, how do we make such an experienced team from all over the world? Oh, wow. Put me on the spot, man. Um, 
You know, one of the things, so, you know, we've been at, I've been at this for three and a half years with Mickey and in when we were staying up all night writing the doc, the decks and making the, the packs and stuff, you always said, like, we're going to amass an army and we're going to create a movement and we're going to do something meaningful, meaningful. And, you know, when it was just literally like four or five of us, you know, racking our brains, how we're going to do this. And then all of a sudden, hey, Mickey, Mickey would come and go, hey, I've got this guy. Um, so Andrew Bardley from the World Bank has been helping us for, well, he used to be ex-chief investment officer for the IFC for crying out loud, comes and starts helping us. And it's like, oh man, we can't pay, afford to pay that guy. <laughs> we're not paying him. You know, so and it's just like this steamroller just started moving and we got, you know, the next person, the next person, the next person. And I think it's, it's a testament to how powerful our mission is and how great our values as a company are. Um, people have tried to to take, you know, poke, poke us and, and say, hey, you, you guys are not doing this or this is fake or whatever. But we're really doing this like we're not messing around. We're not we're not playing. We're not making this up. Um, and before you know it, you know, you've got over 100 people and a lot of them are not getting paid. They're doing it because they love the mission. And and for me, it's all about those mission and values. And that's what has brought us all together to do something worthy and to to do something fun and I learned I learned a few years ago if you if you love your job it doesn't matter how difficult it is or how much volume of work it is just every day is easy and, and better because of it yeah I, I I can add to that you know Andrew Bartley Chris Watson Rene Poisson Mamadou Charles Njoroge John O'Connor Charles Hoskinson as the as the snowball became rolling down the hill it became bigger and bigger and, and people understood that this is one of the world's biggest problems and hey, hold on, maybe World Mobile has a chance to, to fix this. And as the years passed, it's, it wasn't maybe, it was like, oh, look what World Mobile have done. And, and then it's grown bigger and bigger and it doesn't stop to grow bigger and we're, we're attracting um, all types of new talent. Actually, next week we should have an announcement of somebody else that's come onto the team who's pretty influential. Um, so listen out for that and expect only a better team to be created over time. As we get bigger, the attention will, great, will get even bigger and people will want join, to join ship to, to do something great um, as well as one of the biggest business opportunities in, in the history of mankind. So, yeah, I'm proud of my team and I'm proud of the, the people that we have with us. Let's begin to wrap this up with the final set of questions. Um, I know there's a Liverpool match on that many people want to watch, or certainly watch on replay, catch the second half. And um, I'm sure you at the, the AMA watching on YouTube, um, you probably got, you know, uh, some more questions to go, but we've got to save something for the next AMAs as well. Um, so, does John love Mickey, RJ, and Andy as much as it looks like? John, question for you. Oh man, no yeah. pressure, John. No, Mickey, Mickey, and RJ are are just fantastic. Uh, Andy, <laughs> that is <laughs> coffee. You know, if I'm honest, guys, maybe I shouldn't share this, but the the issue is that. Andrew Soper's got a twin brother, Nick Soper, and Nick's just so much cooler than oh, Andy. No. So, you know, when you're spending time with Andy, you're just thinking about Nick, you know? That's how it goes. That's what all the girls say. <laughs> but, uh, that's, um, that's, it's, it's, it's not true. Andy's just as cool as, as Nick. I love Andy. Every, yeah. every, Thanks, everybody, everybody loves Andy. Everybody loves everybody. It's all built from love, reciprocal love. Um, we fans. love you as well, John. I'm Thank down you. with you, Jeez. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's oh, us cutting the onions here or uh, CDSV. <laughs> I got a tear coming out. <laughs> we'll wait for Zanzibar for the for the Africa special uh, number two in June, and Let's then we see. can really show we can really show the love, and hopefully uh, a lot of the world mobile community can come along, and the IOHK and Cardano communities can come along, and we can have uh, one big love fest, one big connected love fest. Um, okay, zero zero at half time. All right, thank you very much for the update there, whoever whoever sent that in, appreciate it. Ooh. Africa is the most uncon unconnected continent on Earth with only 22% of its inhabitants connected to the internet. What do you think there is any room to improve? Hashtag WM probably nothing. RJ. Aerostats and balloons. Aerostats so, and balloons. Aerostats and balloons. That is what needs to happen. Aerostats and balloons. Um, drop in a couple of aerostats here and there. The whole landscape will change. Uh, this figure is going to disappear. Uh, 
you're going to have a different figure go up there and world mobile is going to be able to be one of the pioneers to do this but the future is in the air we've always wanted to go up there and this is where we need to go balloons aerostats aerostats and balloons it, re it, it really is the answer to connecting the unconnected and providing kind of blanket coverage in, in huge rural areas um but yeah agreed let's let's look at that statistic in in say 18 months time and see where we're, where we're at certainly tanzania and, and kenya should be uh, in a far different position all right i think we'll have the last two questions um this one's for rj and andy and mickey any partnership talks with telcos, NGOs, phone make, NGOs, phone makers, charities, or others? Yes, 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 such as Bernardo's and Children in Need and NSPCC and the equivalents uh, there and to provide these kind of centers um, and services to people. But yeah, lots of lots of ongoing talks. I'm a potential customer in one of the current target markets. Assuming that I decide to utilize the WM service, what does the onboarding process look like for me and how do we onboard those without an identity? RJ? So, what currently we're trying to do, what, what, what we're currently trying to do is the onboarding process is a simple KYC. Ideally, your phone number is linked, like for example, in Tanzania. So your phone number is linked to your national register, your national ID identification card. So with that, you're able to port the, the information you need on the member, or I mean the community member trying to log in in terms of KYC. But then you have these individuals that might not have access to actual um, identification. So together with uh, the government agency in Zanzibar, we're working to find solutions that would bridge this by using digital identity, the blockchain technologies, and bring this in to mesh it up to figure out a way of these undocumented individuals can be documented one way or the other. Uh, I think that is the only approach that we are trying to put in right now. Anything else I think will be created as we move along. But ideally for Tanzania, anybody with a mobile phone, a mobile SIM card chip in their phone has to be registered with their national ID card. And with that, the KYC is complete. We just need your phone number, your name, and that's about it. And then you get access to the network, you download the platform, and off you go. It should take you less than 15 to 20 seconds to be able to do this. And we're trying to get that down to even a smaller figure. And once you are on the, pla on the platform, once, you do not need to reload or enter all the time. Wherever you find the network, the network will work. And and those without identity, we're working with the e-government to be able to onboard a physical identity into a teleprism. So that's something that we have in our in our roadmap now with IOHK and uh, and with the e-gov and with with the government of Tanzania. So there will be solutions for this, and that's one of the primary purposes that we're using um, digital ID as well. I think that's it. Is there anything else that John you would like to add to 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 this or RJ or Andy? No, um, I actually got the chance to catch up with Andy in Nairobi a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was super great to hear all the progress that you guys are making on the rollout. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. You guys are doing great stuff, and looking forward to seeing the full scale rollout this year. Thank you very much, John. Very much appreciate you coming on, and uh, as always, let's smash it. Uh, Andy, I'll be seeing you tomorrow in London. Looking forward to it for the James Bowwater event. Big shout out to Somalia. I saw something in the chats there. And yes, RJ is using world mobile internet. And so will many other people be too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. been a great evening. I've enjoyed being your host. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the Have support. a good evening or good morning. Bye. See you next time. Cheers.